going to start in a few minutes. Uh, welcome to see everyone. <coughs> kind of, uh, traffic was off. We had to drive uh, from the time. Yes. Oh, man. Oh, that's so nice. I think the next time I'm going to take, um, go through Tilden Park and come down the other side. Yeah, I'm going to have to go through the tunnel. That's <coughs> my new strategy. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's right. right. That happens, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's okay. It's, it's good. It's good. And I'm not really a driver, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so I really do uh, appreciate you coming out. And if you have a good job, thank you so much. Bob is one of the ladies that neighbor at the Emerville Artist Cooperative in Emerville. Yes. Uh, it's coming. Uh, we're building our studio. Well, I think it was the next uh, six days. It's, um, I mean, I'm bleeding cash, but it's not going to sell some work. I hope you that's me. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but it's, um, I'm excited about it because it will give um, an opportunity for Kimberly and I to, to start collaborating. You know, my, my sweetheart Kimberly, she's a writer. And, and um, so there are some projects we want to, you know, work to work on together. Well, let's see. Uh, oh, yes. No, I'm, just, I'm just holding. Oh, the good. Okay. Okay. I was about to say, uh, there, there's some people trickling yeah, no, in. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll formally to introduce you. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the formal introduction. Oh, well. <laughs> um, but I'm Lori Lynch. I'm the director of I'd like to welcome everyone to the um, St. Mary's College Museum of Art. We're honored to be presenting this artist talk beyond landscapes, art, identity, and mindfulness by Fouad Satterfield for the second annual 44 Days Honoring. Black History, Strength, and Community. Um, a nod to President Barack Obama, the nation's 44th Commander-in-Chief and first African-American president, the 44-Day Initiative highlights the rich contributions of black culture to the nation, the world, and SMC campus. I'd also like to acknowledge the College Committee for Inclusive Excellence, its 44 Days and Black Lives Matter subcommittees, and all those in our community who have contributed to this wonderful series of programs. Um, so now to introduce um, Mr. Fwad. Um, <laughs> Fwad is an East Bay artist who spent his formative years in Southeast Texas and Louisiana. He received his MFA in painting from Louisiana State University. Um, he is also a former professor at Dominican University of California where he taught for 38 years. Yeah. So today he will share his ongoing exploration of nature, his formative years in the Jim Crow South, and how meditation has informed his artistic practice and his new body of work. So please join me in welcoming Juan Thank you. Thank you very much, April. And um, I would just like to say that um, the staff, Patrick and John and Britt, uh, here at the university have been most accommodating to me, uh, helping me to, um, or to produce this beautiful show. And actually, it's always interesting for me because when I don't see the work uh, in a formal setting like this, I'm not really sure what it, how it will perform, how it will come together. And it's always exciting because um, Usually when a work is finished in my studio, I put it away. I don't have it out because it's important that I become detached from it. Um, and it's imperative that, that uh, there are opportunities to have exhibitions so that you can see the work. And you can see it in a, in a group as it was meant to be seen. So I'll come back to that a little later, but I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the, the staff here at have been uh, marvelous in terms of working with me to produce this, this show. Um, about the, uh, and also I want to welcome all of you for coming. Uh, thank you so much. And especially the students who I, as, you know, as uh, April just said, I'm a, an ex uh, emeritus professor and, and I sort of, uh, my, my objective and, and goal was to try to, 
to make uh, important, uh, significant impacts in, and, um, on my students, to try to encourage them to, to develop a vision for themselves, whether it's uh, in a studio or whether it's in whatever fit, uh, discipline they may uh, pursue, it was important that you have a vision for yourself, that, that it's something you strive for, uh, you're in preparation for. So uh, students are very important to me, and uh, I think I will probably always want to interact with them, certainly. Um, I'm uh, presently developing a young cadre of uh, young artists around me to, to support me. Um, Jane Fonda once said, uh, when you, once you pass 70, you can start making uh, young friends. <laughs> so, uh, actually, I thought that was, that was perfect. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm working with um, uh, some young photographers in San Francisco and the East Bay and oh well. And uh, so that's, um, that's important for me because I think um, uh, giving them the expertise. Um, and it, also, I was a curator for 33 years. So in the gallery and uh, designing exhibitions with with lighting particularly and uh, exhibition design was my, was the area that I thought that I excelled best in. Uh, important for me to, uh, uh, to show work in, a, in, in the proper setting and to make it uh, as, as approachable as possible. Because I think one of the important things of any work of art is that it needs to be seen properly. It needs to be understood in the context in which it was made. And so basically, you do the best you can with that. So maybe I'll double back on that a little bit too. So there's a lot of themes in this, and um, the title of this talk, which is, let's see, uh, Beyond Landscape, Art, Identity, and Mindfulness, right? So um, I'll just touch a little bit upon uh, each of those as best I can, and then I'll open up to questions for you. Um, just a little bit about me, a little bit about myself. Um, as April said, I. I taught at Dominican for 38 years. I retired last year, and uh, probably could have gone a little a little longer, but the commute was, was just really I couldn't do it anymore. It was too much. Um, and in that time, I also was a, was a curator of San Marco Gallery. And prior to that, I, um, in preparation to developing expertise and skills as a curator, uh, I worked as a preparatory at Berkeley Art Center from 19. 73 to, uh, to 1980. And there I learned uh, the, the important skills of uh, curation and, and preparatory um, work and considerations, uh, gallery design, uh, certainly lighting. I had a great, uh, great mentors, Carl Worth and Richard Sargent. And so it was a great setting for me. And it was the first serious job I had as a, a maker, as an artist. Okay. Um, prior to that, I was in the United States Army. I was drafted out of graduate school in, uh, I think, 1968, 69. First year, I did one year at LSU um, in studio practice painting. And then, of course, the, the Vietnam War was winding down, and they were desperately looking for bodies. And, and so they started drafting graduate students. And I was one of those that had the unfortunate um, uh, sight of having to report to the Houston facility. And that's exactly where Muhammad Ali had just done his famous rejection of the army and everything. And, and they were pissed off. And um, even though I brought, and I remember I brought this, I had this x-ray of this bad leg that I had, you know. And, <laughs> and I never forget, uh, I gave it to this physician and he, he took it and he dropped it right in the trash can. And I said, oh boy, I'm in trouble now. So, okay, fast forward. Uh, so I did that time and then after that, um, I went back to graduate school and, and then came out to the, um, to the Bay Area. Prior to that, I did my undergraduate work at Southern University, which is also in Baton Rouge. LSU and Baton Rouge were uh, both located <laughs> in the capital of Louisiana. And, um, that was my first um, time just being with, with uh, uh, students that, uh, and peers that basically were from different places around the country. And prior to that, I was in high school. And so what I'm, what I'm, what I'm uh, laying out for you is how the, uh, the time, and you know, I think one of the topics, we talk about Jim Crow and, 
and how that uh, was very uh, formative and instrumental in how it kind of um, affected people. Well, this was what I came up in. And I didn't know that there was any particular um, thing other than that, because I'd never really, I'd always been in a segregated uh, system. The, uh, the schools that we had gone to, and from high school to elementary school, were basically all um, segregated schools. And they were all below the standard. You know, they, in fact, we received books from the uh, white school. And uh, the chapters were torn out, and there were racist remarks all through them. And that was just sort of, you know, what we had to sort of uh, negotiate. But, but the, the important thing is that even though there were not the um, materials <laughs> necessary for um, preparing us for the world in terms of the university, or just uh, for employment, uh, to understand the economic uh, opportunities. There was a sense of creating a vision and having and using your imagination as a tool, as a fundamental tool of your own personal wisdom. And that was the, the great gift that our teachers gave us without all the other things. And I never forget that um, when, I, when, when, I, when my family moved from Orange, Texas to Lake Charles, and I'm going to keep going backwards, um, the name of the school, the elementary school that I attended was called Second Ward. And I said, wow, Second Ward, what kind of name is that? And I realized that um, all the other schools had names, but the black schools had ward names, first ward and second ward. And they looked just like prisons. And so even at eight years old, seven, eight years old, I could see that what this thing was setting us up for it was very interesting, you know. Nevertheless, Given that that was the, the obstacles that we had to work with, we were able to pursue and be resilient enough to be imaginative to work through that to try to find creative solutions that allowed us to not feel that we were truncated in our development. Very interesting. Now before that, I was born in Orange, Texas. Okay, a little town on the, on the Gulf Coast, um, right near Port Arthur, Beaumont, Houston. You know, just, just right there, okay? Um, basically, the, the economic structure was petroleum, you know, petrochemical plants. Um, there was a lot of gas, even back in those days, in the, in the ground. And, and also, um, there were fisheries, I mean, you know, the Gulf Coast. And, so um, this little town I grew up in basically was um, a place that allowed me from one years old to seven years old when I was there during that time. This is where I developed as a human being. This is where I had the opportunity to be free to follow my instinct, my, my, my internal instincts, and just explore the world without any of the the, uh, the pressure of the uh, racist, bigot, terrorist things that were happening around me. My family made sure that I was protected in a supernatural way. Nothing got to me, okay? And I didn't know any other thing. I, and I, as I reflect back on it now, um, I went to kindergarten and um, they sent me back home, and, and I understand the way the story goes is that they said I wasn't ready. Best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> Best thing ever happened. Because what that allowed me to do was to stay home with my great aunt when I was like three, four, five, six years old. And there I was around uh, the elders. I learned how to sew. I learned how to knit, how to crochet, how to cook. I learned how to just um, listen. You know, basically French was what we spoke at home. My mother was in college and my father was a merchant marine and they were putting together the resources to buy our first home. So at seven is when we moved to Lake Charles at our first home. So that's my story, basically. Of, so when we first moved to Lake Charles, this was a city. And I've never, I was this little sensitive kid who had played outside, who had just you know, who realized early on that I was always going to be a maker of some sort. 
Okay, I knew that I would be I would be doing this work. I didn't know exactly this, but I knew something like this I would be doing this. And when we moved to Lake Charles, it finally hit me of the real world that I was in. And that's when I really got to see the segregation, Jim Crow and hatred and was all about. And I had to really just get myself together. So the first thing I did was to try to find friends and allies to support me. And the kids were big, they were bumptious, they were rough. And you know, I'd always been by myself, always making things and you know, very, you know, very uh, sensitive uh, kinds of things. And all of a sudden, you know, and this. So um, that was the beginning of, of really understanding the world I was there. And in a lot of ways, it was my great teacher and the great educator for what prepared me to be able to negotiate the difficult uh, um, things that I had to, uh, to face. Now, growing up in a segregated uh, society, I always found myself being the first to do anything. Okay, I was the first one, uh, I think there was seven of us, who went to LSU. It was the first class of African Americans ever gone there in the graduate program. So here I am, 38,000 to seven. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Imagine the pressure of that, you know? But being that I kind of understood what I was up against, I was undaunted. And you couldn't back me down on any of this. And luckily that year, uh, the uh, graduate program in art had brought up a group of New York artists, Paul George's, Jack Wilkinson, these were, these were like famous figurative artists back in those days. And with them came a cadre of their students. And that was great, that was perfect timing for me. Because I was able to enter this graduate program at a time when we had sort of an international group that was also there. And it was perfect. So you might say that um, that group, uh, and Paul George's, in, in fact probably he was probably my most significant teacher because he was the first one who actually uh, was honest with me about my work. Most of my teachers had not ever been honest with me. They not told me that this work is weak. This part is weak. You should strengthen that. And I think that's terrible, really. And, and, I, and I know as a teacher myself, you know, I've always been very careful about um, helping students understand that when I try to critique them or make comments about their work. It is not to diminish them. It is just to make the work and their expression stronger and clearer and to get closer to their intention. And as I did my time in, at uh, Dominican, I found that um, uh, the last group, I mean, I bless all of you, but the last group, it was harder and harder to do critiques with. <coughs> You know, and so I say, well, maybe it's my time to uh, move on. But you have to be honest. You have to be honest. Uh, how, is, how is anyone able to grow if you're not? You see, and you do no one a service by saying that they're good when they're not. And yet the art and the diplomacy is to do it in such a way that you strengthen the individual, not diminish them. So that uh, is sort of like kinds of the things that, um, in, that informed me and um, gave me a philosophy. Becoming a professor, I never thought I was going to you know, teach at all. You know? It was just a position that was available and I needed a job. And I needed, somewhere to, I needed somewhere to support my studio because my goal was to continue to be a maker. And as you know, this culture has never really been sympathetic with uh, supporting uh, people in the arts. Okay, so you have to really use your, your uh, creativity and imagination to be able to find ways that you can actually pursue your work, uh, maintain your dignity about the work, and at the same time, um, uh, provide a living for your family. So I was able to do that. Where did your artistic abilities come from? You haven't mentioned any of that. Well, exactly not yet. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Like I said, there's only so much we can cover in this. Well, they should have been there from the beginning. Okay, yes, all right. Um, okay, so that's kind of like the foundation. And, 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 uh, and, and what I've just spoken to kind of addresses the 
the 44 day and the and uh, uh, the African American month and the 400 years. Um, you know, the first African American setting foot in Virginia, of course, was 1619, right? Okay. So we should celebrate that, and uh, we've been here a long time, and and I think um, it's important that we uh, recognize that. Now, about the work, about the work itself. I always knew that I would do this work. I feel that I was born to be a, a, a maker. I didn't know I would be a painter, but I knew I would make something. Because the first recollections that I've had as a child with my great aunt is uh, collecting those amazing things that I would find just on my explorations during the day and bring them back under her bed. In those days, the beds were that high off the, off the, um, off the floor. And the, and the, and the um, you know, the covering would go onto the floor, and I had a, created a, a diorama that I was building under this, <laughs> under my great aunt's uh, bed. And I would um, put these, these, these objects that I found, these leaves, these sticks, these rocks, these, these organic things, and, and just look at them and try to find relationships that, where they were pleasing to me. And I didn't know anything about my sensibility. I didn't know about anything about my aesthetic. You know the aesthetics that were that I was striving to uh, to understand, you know, and to and to duplicate outside of myself to see myself in something else. Okay. My aunt Bertha, we call her Mami. Um, she took a trip. She had never gone anywhere. She was a she was a peasant peasant girl from New Iberia, Louisiana. Spoke French. Didn't ever aspire to do anything but just be a, a wonderful matriarch, okay? She decided that she was going to do a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And I think she was maybe 60, 60 ish, I'm trying to think now, maybe 67, 68, 70 maybe. And we were terrified, the family was terrified. Oh, and Bertha has never gone anywhere, she's going to travel by herself. And she left. And uh, she was going to stay a couple of months, well she stayed for almost a year. During that time, she started sending home these steamer trunks full of relics. And as this little kid, opening up those trunks and seeing all of these things from Rome, from France, from Spain, from Palestine, it, it just really, I said, wow, this is the world I want to be in. This is what I want to do when I grow up. I want to make stuff. I want to like this. I want to be in this world. And that was really the beginning of the codifying that I, I liked making stuff, but I knew I had to do that. And that was the beginning, and I think it was about seven, six or seven. And from then on, it was basically, at first I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer in high school, uh, junior high, high school. I was making my own, my own clothes. I, was, I would buy stuff off the rack and read redesign it, you know, um, for my friends, capes, the whole, I mean, just the whole thing, you know, um, much of which young people wear now, we did that, you know, we had that, we did that, you know, the, the, the tight pants, the whole thing. And um, so I told my parents, I announced to them one, one day that I wanted to go to New York and go to fashion school. And of course they said, oh God, no, brother, no. <laughs> and so they just absolutely said no. And, uh, you know, so I resigned myself to finish high school, and, and I was still just kind of creative for a little bit, but not really, you know, I never really made a painting, I never made a sculpture, but I, but I was always uh, re-articulating things. Just, um, and I noticed that I liked, um, I liked arranging things. So I think the idea of uh, relationships and, and finding exquisite kinds of uh, nuances within things that are different and bringing them together was very important for me, just the way I kind of was made on the inside, you know, and how I want to see the world on the outside. So, um, high school graduation came along and I wasn't really sure, and then all of a sudden my friends were going to university, and I said, well, I guess I'll go too. And then I just said, well, I've got to declare a major, so I might as well make it art. And that was the beginning of basically to studying painting as a profession, a Okay. So, 
that's how I came to that. Now, just a little bit about the work. Um, April, how are we doing time-wise? Is she with us? Yes, you're, you're good. We'll open it up for questions. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, about now? Sure. Okay, well, just a little more. Let me say just one more thing about okay. um, just the work. Okay. Um, so this body of work, and I'll open it up to all of you, um, is a continuation of work that's been done in Salem about ten, about 10 years. And it started with um, the painting that's at the lower ramp, which was the first one. And it uh, actually allowed me to think about uh, making a series of works that were somehow related and eventually they could be stacked, buttressed up against one another, top and bottom, sides, and just kind of in a, a, an arrangement, a, a random way. And it would still work because what I tried to do was to keep the, the visual modules pretty much similar. The strokes and the brushes, uh, the brush strokes and the marks, I try to keep them so they were fairly uniform, so in any configuration, they would work. Now, I've never had a chance to see that. Uh, this is the closest thing I've seen with having 12 of these paintings uh, in a, uh, a gallery. The goal was to, to have them in a space where I could have at least 20 of them to basically to have the larger pieces to really see the possibility of what I'm trying to do, which is to create a a space, a kind of locus for, to bring people together. That's my goal. Or a sanctuary, where someone could come and just as a contemplative space to imagine the possibilities, or just sit, to be inspired, or to be entertained, but a place for bringing people together. That's the goal. So I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. And we'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, yes, uh, I'll go. To, yes, you and yes, yes, ma'am. And then. Uh, well, looking back on your early entry into the art world, why do you think your teachers were not being honest with you? Uh, well, okay. At the graduate level, they were not honest because they thought that um, that I wasn't good, and there was no, and uh, they didn't want to waste their time with me. And they were mainly, again, they were, you know, um, they just, I, I can tell because they gave me always the weakest professors to work with me. You know, and I knew that. And it wasn't until Paul George's came where he was the first one who was honest. He was a New Yorker, so they don't, they didn't pull any punches, you know. And he told me, he said, this is, you know, this is where you can improve, this is good, this is not, you know. And uh, so it was that kind of instruction I needed. I'm the kind of person. You need, to get, you need to show me the manual. Just show me the manual and leave me alone. I will do the rest. But show me the manual and show me how to work with the, the manual. Or, and when I say that, I mean it's a metaphor. Show me how it's done well and let me see what I can do. Okay, but don't show me something mediocre and tell me I need to strive for that. That's, yes. Bob? Oh, Two uh -huh. Two items. Yes. First, tell us about your parents and how they were motivational in your development. And the second is tell us about why you came to California and what it was like to uh, become a California as a, a Californian as opposed to a whatever a Louisianian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, 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 right. Well, first of all, uh, Louisiana is a, it's a wonderful place. It's beautiful. Um, it's um, it, it, it's an old world place. You know, and it has a lot of history that basically is is negative and positive you know but like any place though it's it's the people that, that you know um but to answer your question um what was the first one again the first one i wanted to know about your parents oh yeah my parents yeah no, no my parents were wonderful my parents were wonderful my my, my, my mother was um uh she was a fifth grade uh, teacher in, in elementary school uh she uh, went, went to college on a basketball scholarship and she was little, but she was tough. Uh, my father was, uh, uh, he was a, a barn entrepreneur who had no money, <laughs> you know? And in those days, he couldn't borrow any money, you know? So he was frustrated, I could tell. But, but one thing about them, they supported me. They saw that their son was, uh, was being drawn to this thing called art. And they were terrified because they didn't know how I would make a living for myself. And it, as any parents, you, 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 you think about that. But they never said no. They always supported me. But I could tell they were terrified. You know, and I regret that uh, they were not able to, 
to see uh, my development uh, to this day, but I know that that's, but that's, but they were setting me up for that. So I, I, I really appreciate that. The other thing is, um, I came to um, the Bay Area. My sweetheart thing in college was from Berkeley. And I just uh, ETS'd out of the Army in Oakland, right? Downtown, you know, Oakland. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting little story. I'll get to your question in a minute. Uh, so, come straight from Vietnam. I, 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 my, my day is, I'm done, right? My time is up called ETS, it's a time of departure. And they said, oh, you can't, um, you can't separate from the Army in fatigues. And I, you know, you know. And I said, I said, but I don't know where my dress, my dress uniform is. And they said, well, you have to buy one. And I said, you mean just a, a buy one just to walk through this gate? He said, yeah. So my last paycheck in the United States Army was buying a uniform that I only wear one time to walk through a gate to separate from the Army. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and from there, I immediately went to Cal, and I, was, uh, I met my friends, and, and here I am with this dressed Army green thing, you know, this was during the 60s, right? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And I was, I was standing out, and I was looking really weird, you know, and, you know, but it was, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was humorous. So. But that's my California story, but uh, my, my sweetheart was from Berkeley, and that's why I came. So basically, and, uh, and I've been here ever since. Yes, yes, questions? Uh, first, it's a coincidence. Oh, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Southern, half and half. Oh, really? So I was amazed. I didn't know that. Um, oh, wow. So we had that in common. But I just wanted to see if you could speak a bit about the role that you played in contemplative practices in creating. Yeah, oh, yeah, no. That's, work yeah, that's an important one. Yeah, that's the part that, that always gets pushed to the end. And at the same time, it's really the one that's up front. You know, because. Um, Beyond the landscape form, beyond the art, the identity, is uh, it's all tied up in, in, in mindfulness. And what is mindfulness but just simply being present with the thing you're doing? You know, it's not deep. This is not deep at all. And there are practices that can support that to make uh, the efficiency of how one can focus on something to produce something, you know, optimally, you know, and uh, in real time and how to work towards not letting distractions pull you away from that which you're trying to strive to, to make manifest. So that's really the way I see mindfulness, and that's the way I use it. Um, we have some, uh, med uh, some serious meditators here from the ashram in, in, uh, in Oakland, and you know, they, they are serious and understand this, and, and we have the, the honor of having great meditation teachers, okay? great master teachers in meditation who helped us to kind of, and at the same time, the, the point is, is that uh, this is what we, this is another tool that we are able to use to work towards our objectives, whatever they are, and to make our vision of whatever it is for you manifest more fully, efficiently, and properly, okay? You know, however, whatever you use. But for me, it's been a very important uh, tool. I've had, the, I've had the honor of spending time with the uh, Dalai Lama. I've done uh, two uh, uh, workshop studies with him. And uh, also with Thich Nhat Hanh, who is an uh, amazing master, meditation master. You know, uh, Guru, Guru Mai Shavalasananda. Um, you know, so I, I, feel, I feel so rich with, the, with having had the, uh, the, the, the experience and the wisdom and the direction from these great masters to help me so that I could be more fully present in doing this work. Because that's, what I, that's just what, this is what I do. This is what I do. And my colleague standing here who's another great painter. Mm -hmm. Yes, right there. Well, um, thank you so much for coming out. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, so, you know, we, you know we, 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 we take this very serious and it's, um, it's our life. And of course, we, we have to be as authentic, as honest that we possibly can you know, because after all, what it is, it's giving, it's giving something to someone else. And when I make the work, uh, immediately I'm detached for it, it, and the work does what it does on its own. You know, I, I have nothing else to do with it. And I just want to make something that could draw people to it in a way that they can have some a possible aesthetic experience or not, or just use it in any way they, they, they so wish. So that's how meditation and mindfulness practice, usually the Buddhists say mindfulness, um, 
you know, the, uh, the, uh, the group sitting meditate, which is pretty much the same thing, it's just a different, you know, uh, mechanism, but it's the same thing. Yes, dear. Hi, um, thank you for coming to campus yeah, and yes. sharing with us. Pleasure. Um, so I know that some African American artists often get the critique that because they're African American they should be doing certain subject matters. Yes. And while I don't agree with that, I'm just curious what your response would be. Yes. To that. Well, you know, I did that. I did all of that. You know, because uh, in in, uh, grad, in undergraduate school and graduate school, I did figurative. You know, sixties. What else were you going to do? You know, it was all about um, resistance. It was about the uh, the cultural revolution that was happening. It was about uh, the, the the assertion of the black rights. You know. Uh, 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 Brown versus Board of Education was only five years pr previous to that. You know, this was like a tumultuous time in America. You know, it was coming of age in its own historical uh, paradigms. The, its myths were being unraveled in a way, you know. So, yes, I did that because that was uh, important for that time, to do this kind of narrative. Um, and then it evolved. It evolved and I realized that it wasn't really who I was or what I felt I had to do. You know, for an example, my mentor, uh, Oliver Jackson, you know, he uses figures in such a way that he doesn't tell stories, but he uses figures in the same way that I use the, the, uh, uh, the nuances for trying to um, uh, express uh, texture within foliage. It's just uh, an element of communication, but they don't necessarily have to tell a story. So I'm open. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, and, and, and again, when I was a curator, I, there was lots of work I didn't really care for, but the work was really done well. And I showed that work. Because why? Because I thought that particularly the students could learn something. So that for me was important. It's not what I like. Is it done well or not? So. Thank you. Yes. Yes. You um, mentioned that when your work is finished, you put it away yes. because you don't want to look at it. Or for a while, yes. A while. yes. How soon do you do that, and how many works do you work on simultaneously? Uh, I try to have about, uh, usually I have about three works out, two to three. And uh, because, you know, you, you, you work on one and uh, you're, you let it get gestate, uh, when I find that my lead works out too long, I will continue to go back into them and, and kill them. <laughs> you know, so... Um, it's almost like saving the work from the artist. <laughs> you know, not letting the artist do his own deeds, you know, to, to himself or herself. Um, and also just uh, the time of just reflection, of just doing something and, 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 and just stepping back from it, detaching from it. In fact, a, a curator told me one time from a gallery, said, Fois, you're the only artist I know when, you, when I come to your studio, there's no workout. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's right. You know, so you know, so that's you know. I just um, because when I'm done, when I'm done, I'm I, I need to rest, and if I and, and if it's not put away, I keep going back to it. I keep it just draws and and, and I just sometimes I can't restrain myself. So it's it's uh, saving the piece, and um, and many a work have been killed that way. Many many a piece, you know, and was not able to come back from the. From his demise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Are you working outside or inside? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I work inside uh, because I need to control the uh, the environment that I'm working with. Uh, I work in um, a media that uh, is is rather sensitive in terms of uh, how long you can keep it and and you can't have too many extraneous elements out here from outside, you know, affecting your so it's it's pretty it's pretty quick. Um, uh, it's it, uh, this material is water based, it, even though it looks like oil, um, and they start off as gigantic watercolors in the beginning. You know, and it's it's in fact last night I forgot it. I wrote this thing. I, I had all these wonderful notes for you guys, you know, <laughs> and uh, I walked off the left. So maybe it was a reason. <laughs> but, but about three o'clock, I got this. I got this. Uh, this this thing, and uh, I, I wrote it down. Turned a little more down. And it was about um, uh, just painting itself. You know, the the, the the process of painting itself, moving the, the materials in the in the water, and and the water spreading over the surfaces, and then the the amount of provocation you put in and conviction you put in the actual stroke, you know, it, it, it makes a particular mark, you know, and, and, and so this is where the power and the ritual, I think, of painting, for me, 
it's really all about. And this is why when I'm doing this work, I can't have a lot of distractions around me. You know? And if they are, they, 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 I tend to just kind of, they just kind of disappear because I'm, so, I'm, I'm trying to get into this thing and it's me and it and, 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 and I call it a ritual because it is. Because I'm invoking, I'm invoking the narrative of what makes me do this and often, and I want to close with this. You know, um, I am deeply affected and touched by the, uh, the, the degradation of uh, the environment, of the social struggle of people, homelessness, the, the, uh, uh, just the, 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 the dire straits that people find themselves in. And, and I just, I, and, I, and, I, and I think about it and I say, Fouad, Fouad, what can you do? What can you do to participate to try to humiliate some of this suffering? And the only thing, and the answer that keeps coming back to me over and over again is this. Fouad, go to your studio and make the most magnificent paintings you can. That's what comes up. So this is my work. So I'd like to end with that, unless there are any other questions. <laughs> Uh, we have time for yeah. one more. One more? Okay, yes. just gentlemen, I think right here, right? Do you? No. <laughs> oh, hold on, I'm sorry. We have two more. We have time for two more. Oh, yeah, okay, two more. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you go out into nature and see something? Oh, yes. It's just amazing. Do you take a picture or are you able to just take it in? You're asking for my home? secrets now. You're asking for <laughs> my secrets away. Uh, both. Both. I. Uh, I take a visual record, and then I'm imbibing what I want this thing to do. So both. You're right. I need the structure. I need the composition to work with. But within the composition is where I try to, to bring this, this thing into it. And this is where the, my narrative uh, starts. And I can speak about uh, the things that, that bother me. Okay, using the landscape as the, as, the, as, the, as the vehicle for the narrative. So yes, both. Yes, and the, April, yes, yes, please. Uh, what does, how does water impact your painting? Oh, well, you know, I'm from, I'm from the Gulf Coast. Yeah, that's true. I'm from the Gulf Coast. I was born just uh, not even a mile from the Sabine River, the, the river that separates Louisiana from Texas. It was all about water. It was all about... Uh, flora and fauna, uh, just the, the, the proliferation of, of, of growth and, 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 and wildlife. I mean, just, you know, that was like, yeah. you know, that so uh, water to me is symbolic of, of purification, of, uh, of life itself, and wherever it meets land, particularly, that's the subtle transition from, from, a, um, from, from, from one life form to another. So I use this a lot. You'll see this a lot in my work. You know, because sometimes it's inseparable yeah. where the land and where the water is, and how they basically uh, share a boundary. I'm not, I'm not. And as a subtlety, and as a painter, it's just a rich um, area to paint because it allows you such freedom in that sector, which I like a lot. And it gives me an opportunity to work with blue and blue greens, which I have difficulty with because I can't see them. So I just I just told you something that you know there, but now you know. <laughs> I have a very difficult time seeing up blues and blue greens. So I, I, I work with them a lot just to try to understand them more. Okay. So I hope I hope that was uh, interesting for you. I, I I mean we could go on, you know, I think I was thinking about this. I told Kim, I said, um, you know, parts of this these talks like volumes, and you could pull up one volume and spend a couple of days with that, and and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in the uh, biography I will do at some point, I'll be able to articulate more fully and really get into the nuance of the the various periods because of great stories in, and uh, in this, and um, so I look forward to that, and also having a body of work that could also um, support that that story. And that volume will also be available on. Our website. Yeah, at some <laughs> so point. Of this yes, talk, yeah, yes, so yes, at some point. So I, I would like to encourage all of you to consider uh, picking up an uh, exhibition catalog because I think it, it could be that it's a valuable and important um, um, uh, 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 piece by Jan Worm in, in it. Uh, she, a beautiful, insightful, in depth understanding of my work. In fact, she even amazed me. I, I didn't realize that 
but it was a beautiful piece, and also with Megan Wilkinson, and, and um, so I want to thank all of you for coming, and I'll be available for a little bit if you have any further questions. Okay, so thank you. By a master um, brother here on campus yes. that specifically invites you to um, step into Quad's work and um, and so and, and many other programs. So we do have a mailing list at on the at the front desk. So feel free to um, add your email if you're not already on our list. And as Quad mentioned, the catalogs are also available at our gift shop um, as our other wonderful things. So. Um, we are accepting cash and checks. The catalogs are $20. Um, there is an ATM on campus if necessary, but um, the gift shop is generally open, so you're more than welcome to come back. And then we also have the opening reception next Thursday from 7 to 8.30, so feel free to join us for that as well. Yeah, now we, now we need to change the show. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm totally new page, so. <laughs> Please um, help yourself to refreshments in the patio. Yeah, so thank you again thank you so for much. watching. Right. Oh, no. <laughs>